Okay, great. So let's all settle in and let's take a moment to arouse our bodhicitta, our intention for our time together. Thank you. So we're going to uh, have a slightly different format today. Usually we begin right off the bat with the meditation, but I'd like to introduce the topic first and then we'll meditate. So the meditation will happen really in the, in the, in the middle of the practice. And then we'll have time for discussion coming right out of practice, asking questions and, and so on afterwards, okay? So I'm aware that last week uh, Eve introduced the, the one of the four measurables called joy and or empathetic joy. And so I am going to continue with the four measurables while we uh, finish off the summer. Eve and I will, will continue with this wonderful topic called the four measurables or in the earlier teachings called the Brahma Viharas. And then come September, we will begin a new book study group. So we will announce that book uh, soon, whether in social media over the next week or in the next week's class. So stay tuned. And that will give those of you who are regulars time to get the book and uh, take a look at it. I think uh, we've landed on a really good one, but I want to wait to announce it a little bit longer. Okay. So it's great to be here with you all. It's nice to see you. And what I'm going to do is give a little bit of an overview of the four immeasurables and then dive into one of the other ones, which is equanimity. And then we'll do the practice of equanimity as our meditation practice. So we'll talk for about 10 or 15 minutes and then we'll practice. So I'm just going to make sure I have my little notes here. Yeah. Okay, so the four measurables are really one of the most important backbones to Mahayana teachings, but actually they were taught by the Buddha as well. So they consist of four very important aspirational practices called loving kindness, compassion, equanimity, and joy. So for those of you who really um, are devoted to Dharma and have studied for a while, those those will soon, if they're not already, kind of roll off your tongue. They're very common teachings, they're very beautiful teachings, and very important practices for us to cultivate and to really take to heart and not just think about intellectually. So in the Metta Sutta, which is the Sutta or Sutra on loving kindness, the early text teachings on loving kindness, which is Metta, the Buddha Shakyamuni, taught that the cultivation of the four immeasurables would cause the practitioner to be reborn into a blissful realm of Brahma. So this is why they're called the Brahma Viharas, the divine abodes. Brahma is the creator god in Hinduism or an Indian thought, and is really considered uh, kind of less the, um, uh, theistically as the kind of the ultimate state, the ultimate nature of mind even. I've heard some teachers draw that metaphor or analogy or parallel with uh, Brahma as well. So I'm hearing somebody, uh, maybe somebody's not muted. So let's make sure everybody's muted. Um, and so these divine abodes uh, are early on believed to be actually places that you would go if you did the practice and achieve the practice that you would actually be reborn in a divine abode like the loving kindness or compassion or joy or equanimity but later they became known more as states of being to be cultivated in this life not literal heaven realms that we go to after death and in the Metta Sutta, the Buddha taught to radiate out to all beings in all directions, the mental states of loving kindness, which is metta, 
Sanskrit is Maitri. Uh, I could just paste these, this nice little tidy list so you all see the Sanskrit rather than just having them listen to it in my chat. Yes. Okay. So you'll see in the chat, the first is loving kindness. In Sanskrit, it's Maitri. But in Pali, the earlier language of India, one of the many languages of India, not the actual language the Buddha taught in, which is common misperception. Uh, he actually spoke a language associated with the region he was born in called Magadha. And Pali came later and was the language that his teachings were actually written down in around the maybe second century BCE. 300, 400 years after his death. In any case, in Pali, it's metta. In Sanskrit, it's maitri. That means loving kindness or simply love. Literally, the connotation is that of friendliness. So it's not a romantic love or possessive love or even a familial love. It's a feeling of friendliness, of kindness towards yourself and others. Metta or maitri. Second is compassion in Sanskrit and in Pali, it's karuna, karuna. And then the third is empathetic joy, mudita, also the same in Pali and in Sanskrit. And then the fourth is equanimity. In Sanskrit, it's upeksha. In Pali, which isn't noted here, it's actually upeka, upeka. I don't know if it has an H in there, but... It would be like Upeka, or at least, or, you know, I'm not a poly scholar, but it might have an H after the K. It might have two Ks. I'm not sure, but it's just without the SH. And that is equanimity. So traditionally, those practices would be taught in this order that I've given you here. But in the Tibetan tradition, for some reason, it might be maybe Shanti Deva or one of the great Indian Mahayana teachers might have popularized a, a way of studying these where you take the fourth one and you do it first. So you do equanimity first. Why? Because what the teachings say is that loving kindness, compassion, and empathetic joy, if they're not imbued with equanimity in terms of caring equally for enemies, loved ones, and neutral people, for example, then they're not true immeasurables. They're not really a Brahma Vihara. And so we should learn about equanimity first and then imbue that into the other three. So that's how in Tibet they teach it. That's how I learned it. Um, and so I figure we'll go back to equanimity today. I know Eve taught on joy, which is fine too, because you don't have to teach them or learn them in order. They're all interrelated. It's not a sequential thing necessarily. Uh, but I know she's reading a book called The Path of Joy, and she was excited to share joy. So often that's the best reason of all. <laughs> you want to get a teacher to teach something. It's nice if they're excited about the topic and they're not going to be boring with it. So I'm sure that was a wonderful class. So a, a funny story. I don't know if I've told this before, but I'll tell it again. Uh, there's a funny saying, never underestimate the joy people have when they hear something they already know. <laughs> right? So um, who said that? Was that Mark Twain? Yeah, could be. In any case, if you know, you can chat it in. So the Buddha taught the Metta Sutta in response to something that occurred that I find very interesting. So the story goes that one day he instructed his monks to go practice in the forest and to do shamatha, more like contemplative practice, concentration practices. So the monks went into the forest with their provisions and planned on living there for a while and doing their, their concentration practices. But what happened, what they didn't realize was that they were actually moving into an area that was already inhabited by animals, but also spirits. Uh, different kind of tree spirits, animal spirits, maybe like water spirits and so on, earth spirits. And these spirits were not happy about these people moving in on their space and disrupting their harmony. So they started creating all sorts of trouble for the practitioners. 
they started to appear to them as nightmares in their dreams at night, um, visions during meditations of disgusting, horrible, kind of terrifying things, trying to scare the monastics out of their place in the forest. So eventually the monks couldn't handle it anymore. So they ran out of the forest. They went back to Buddha and they said, we are having a hard time. This is what's happening. And we're sensing that um, we're not, we don't belong there. You know, this is, is this is not feeling uh, like a friendly place or an easy place to practice. So what the Buddha did is he, the story goes that he armed the, his monks with the armor of loving kindness. What he did is he taught them the metta sutta in that moment. And that became this famous sutta that I'm talking about where he talks about the four immeasurables, starting with love, metta. And so after learning the metta sutta, they were sent back off into the forest and they were able to practice loving kindness, compassion, equanimity, and joy to towards these spirits who were at times appearing to them as, uh, you know, hor hor horrific visions, monsters, and so on. So those would be the so-called enemies or temptresses, which is common in Buddhist stories. The women were always the temptresses. What are you going to do? Now, if the teachings were told from a female perspective, maybe the men would always be the tempters, <laughs> right? Or we could totally get out of heteronormative ways of thinking and we wouldn't even be boxed in in terms of that. But yes, there is a lot of gender bias in the Buddhist suttas. That's probably not news to you. In any case, so what the monks did was they applied the practice of sending loving kindness to those energies that were challenging them, trying to create obstacles for them, cause them harm and so on, fear. And over time, the spirits, the energies realize, okay, these guys aren't so bad. Maybe we can live in harmony with them and they calm down. And then they were able to live and cohabitate uh, in, a, in a harmonious way. So that is the impetus of the Metta Sutta, which is so cool because, you know, sending aggressive energy or people or spirits loving kindness is really counterintuitive to most of us who grow up in the west and it's so brilliant it's such an alchemical uh, term of uh, that which you would normally um, push away or uh, hate or feel as an enemy you're actually taking them as your friend and feeling love and compassion for them and i think all of us have people or situations or groups of people or who knows family members <laughs> exes in our lives that we love to hate but it doesn't do anyone any good so even in the worst of our conflict as lojong practitioners as dharma practitioners if we can remember oh buddha taught to actually love our enemies just like jesus did love thy neighbor do unto others as you would have done unto you, turn and offer love to the person you actually uh, think that you're quite um, justified in hating. And that's really the root of the Donglen practice. So then Donglen, or sending and receiving, takes the metta a step further. And not only do we wish uh, for freedom from harm, fear, danger, like we do in metta but in donglen we add the element of then having the courage to or the bodhisattva intention to breathe in and actually kind of metaphorically not literally take on the suffering of the other transform it at the heart space and then breathe out the remedy so metta is like a introductory level to donglen and in my view which is an introductory level to chu which, uh, how many people in this group know Cha or have studied it, or know a little bit about it even? Raise your hand. A little bit? Yeah, so some do, some don't. That's okay. Um, so Cha is the practice developed by the 11th century female Tibetan yogini, Machi Glavdran, based on Mahayana and early teachings of the Buddha, particularly on the Prajnaparamita Sutras that, that really highlighted compassion and wisdom in the Mahayana era. 
she based her teachings of Chu on these Mahayana sutras called the Pragya or Prajna Paramita, the Perfection of Wisdom sutras. And she also implemented indigenous, uh, more shamanic traditions from Tibet and Mongolia. That thus the double-sided drum is quite big, bigger than the Indian Damaru drum. And the practitioner plays that with the right hand, and it sounds like the heartbeat. And then a bell in the left hand, so they they move in unison. And then the practitioner will chant prayers, mantras, visual and visualize offering beings. Uh, nectar and satisfying them completely. It's very similar to chu. It's basically the roots. I mean, it's very similar to feeding your demons. If you've learned that, then you've learned basically an aspect of the chu practice, which is very cool. But you can see how that's also based on Mahayana, the um, Donglen practices, which is based on the metta, the early practices taught by the Buddha. So as we move through the phases of development of Buddhist practice and theory, we don't leave behind what came before. We actually build on it and use that as a foundation for then the next step, the next step. So then everything, Vajrayana or Tantric Buddhism, envelops the middle and the early phases as well. And it's very much based on that and, and respects that. And all Vajrayana practitioners learn the earlier teachings. And technically, they're not even supposed to be getting the tantric teachings if they haven't mastered the early sutric, you know, Theravadan teachings, and then the middle, the Mahayana teachings on bodhicitta. Because without bodhicitta, the spiritual power that can come from yogic practices that are found in tantra can be misused, can be abused especially for teachers. You know, that's when you see sexual abuse, you know, abuse of power, money abuse, and so on. It happens a lot, sadly. So back to the four immeasurables, the Buddha first taught them in this metta sutta. They were originally called the Brahma Viharas, the divine abodes. Divine is Brahma, Vihara is abode. Vihara is a beautiful word. It's also the name for communities like sanghas, like ashrams, basically, in the Buddhist time. So Vihara was a place with a temple and living quarters where the community of practitioners could come together and live and eat and practice together. Vihara. But in this context, it means abode, and Brahma means divine. Later in Tibetan, they came to be known as Tsemeji. Tsemeji. Tsemeji is, I can write it for you if you want. Tsemeji. Well, first, Brah, Brahma Viharas, divine abodes. And then later in the Mahayana, they became known as the four immeasurables. In Tibetan, it's se, me, ji. Se me is immeasurable. Ji is the number, number four. Se me ji. So one of the greatest Buddhist teachers from Tibet in the last few hundred years was named Patrol Rinpoche. Patrol Rinpoche. And he wrote a classic text that but basically, everybody who studies Tibetan Buddhism will read. It's called The Words of My Perfect Teacher. The Words of My Perfect Teacher by Patrol Rinpoche. It's probably something that we wouldn't read as a book study in here because it's so traditional. <laughs> I mean, I've done this book as a book study, but I don't think it's something you would want to do. It's it's pretty it's pretty good, but it you have to wade through all this long discussion of like the hell realms, and it turns a lot of modern Westerners off. <laughs> they don't want to read about the hell realms. Um, now they're metaphors, but still. Uh, but then in the second part of the book, they get into bodhicitta and wisdom, and it's a wonderful book because he has all sorts of really cool stories. Gives you a real flavor for, for Dharma in Tibet. I enjoy the book. It's a classic. So I recommend it if, you, if it's something you're interested in. In any case, in that book, 
Patrul Rinpoche says that loving kindness is usually dealt with first, but when we practice the four one after the other as a training for the mind, meaning lojong, which means mind training, we should start by developing impartiality, which is another word translated for uh, equanimity. Tibetan, it's dangnyom. In Sanskrit, it's, um, uh, it's the yeah, upeksha, upeksha. So um, otherwise, he says, whatever love, compassion, and sympathetic joy we generate may tend to be one-sided or imbued with subtle grasping. I thought that was interesting. So we might, you know, be doing metta, but we want something in return, <laughs> or we want to feel special. So I think this is very interesting. So that's why today we're going to explore equanimity, or another way of saying it is impartiality. As I said, uh, the Tibetan is Tang Nyom, Tang Nyom. I, I like studying words because we can learn a lot from them. Tang, T-A-N-G, means to give up, actually. It means giving up in, in the sense of letting go of our attachment, but letting go of our hatred for enemies and our attachment onto friends and family. So in that sense, having an even-minded which means nyom. So nyom means even-minded. Dang nyom, to give up, and then to have an even-minded mind. Dang nyom. So we have an even-minded attitude towards all beings, free of attachment to those close to us and aversion to those who are distant. So this is a real challenge for a lot of us, you know, all of us, I would say, in this call, if I'm not mistaken. We're not monastics, right? So we're going to perhaps have family. We're going to have kids. We're going to have family ties that are important. And sometimes dharma, especially monastic dharma, can seem very um, almost passive aggressive towards those of us who own, who have families, right? Like, oh, don't care about what your family, if you follow what your family says, you'll be led astray, you know, that kind of wording. But we have to kind of take all of that with a grain of salt and recognize that for the most part, these texts were written for monastic and um, people who had taken the vows of celibacy, right? So they're not having family, they're not having kids. But we can still learn from these teachings on being free of aversion for those who we don't like, and also attachment, to be free of attachment to those who are close to us doesn't mean we don't love them. I know that the attachment theory is very important. I'm a mother. I definitely appreciated the attachment theory and you know, building strong and healthy, secure attachments with my family and uh, partners and so on throughout the years. And so I appreciate that. We're not saying that's bad. Buddhists just mean attachment in terms of clinging. It's really uh, important to understand the way things are translated. Okay, so zinba and is the Tibetan word for clinging. Uh, sometimes it's translated as attachment, but I think clinging really tells us a little bit more about what we're talking about. You know, when somebody's clinging, it's like static cling. You know, it's like you don't want it there, but it's there. It's that type of feeling of maybe an imbalanced attachment where there's too much. Mm, like a neediness, a sense of emptiness that is causing someone to be clingy onto you or you onto them or a dynamic that doesn't quite feel healthy, right? And so um, it's, it's, this is what they're talking about, where in the practice of impartiality, we develop a sense of a bit more spaciousness, right? Instead of clinging, we have an open fist, an open palm, and if somebody wants to be with us, and they'll just sit right there in the palm, <laughs> you know what I mean? Don't really hold on to them like that and make them feel claustrophobic. Likewise, if we don't like anyone, we can work with our feelings of aversion towards them. But we don't have to hate them. You know, we can just meet those feelings, shake hands with those feelings. As Sokni Rinpoche says, that shaking the hands with the challenging emotions, but also recognize that... Um, you know, sometimes our enemies are our greatest teachers, that everything isn't black or white. And therefore, we can actually create space to appreciate 
those beings that we find very challenging because they teach us something. They teach us patience, they teach us fortitude, and they teach us how to speak our own truth, you know? So classically, what the teachings say on impartiality or equanimity is that this practice involves learning to accept loss and gain, praise and blame, success and failure, all with a quality of non-attachment, of non-clinging, equally for oneself and for others. So you might lose a game one day, but who knows, maybe you'll win the next day. You know, that, that's more of a lesson for the small children who are very hyper-competitive, like my son, who just couldn't stand losing. You know, it took him a while to learn how to be cool when he lost a game. And, um, but through maturity and experience, we learn to actually naturally have more equanimity. Another comment I want to make is that equanimity is actually meaning not to distinguish between friend, enemy, or stranger, but regard every sentient being as equal. So that's something to aspire towards. It's not easy. I, I definitely am not there yet, but I try, I try to remember. And instead it is a clear minded, tranquil state of mind, not being overpowered by delusions, mental dullness or agitation. So it's, it's having that equanimity, equipoise, which is very much cultivated in like shamatha, as well as Vipassana practices. Patrol Rinpoche says that those whom we now consider our enemies have surely been at one point or another in some past life, our friends. Perhaps they took care of us affectionately and gave us help and support and vice versa, by the way, you know, maybe your friends or loved ones now have been enemies in the past or will be enemies in the future. The whole point is to try to have a quality of impartiality and even handedness with respect to the neutral people that we don't know and the people we love or hate. It's interesting, my son yesterday was telling me about a good friend of his, I'll tell this story and then we'll practice, um, who is very bright, but they debate a lot. You know, they don't agree on a lot of things and they go head, head to head. And he said, you know, my friend said this thing that was so crazy and we had a good debate about it. And I really try to be a good influence on him. My son said to, to me last night, he said, he said, the friend said, you know, I don't, I don't know the people of Ukraine, so I don't really care about them. And I was glad to hear that my kid was like, hey, man, you have to, you have to um, investigate that statement and really check yourself, you know, and so he proceeded to tell me how their debate went. But I thought that was interesting because the so-called neutral person category is actually pretty much most of the planet, right? We don't know most of the people on the earth. So practicing and cultivating equanimity, cultivating love, compassion, and joy towards that very big category of people, the so-called neutral people is a very important and juicy place to sit and to practice and feel what that's like for you. I'm not going to give you answers or anything, but I'm, I, I, in a way, I'm bringing that up because for me, I always thought that the juicy part was working with the enemies. But it wasn't until I started teaching Lojong more consistently where I realized, oh, this domain of the neutral person is really rich and really important and could help someone like my son's friend who thinks that just because he doesn't know people that he shouldn't care about them. You know, sadly, these types of comments are being peddled on social media by people who are making millions of dollars being, you know, um, you know, hotshot TikTok commentators or whatever. And these kids are being influenced by this stuff. It's terrifying. <laughs> but there's also a lot of good and a lot of a lot of smart kids out there who are also um, pushing back against some of this vapid um, way of thinking. So, in any case, you know this practice was important. 
2,600 years ago, and it's important today. So having said that, let's go ahead and do the practice. And what I'm going to do is guide you through a version. There are many different ways you can do equanimity practice. And what I'll guide you through tonight is a, is a version of equanimity practice taught by my teacher, Lama Soltra Malioni. It might be a little different than what you're used to if you've done this before. Um, but it's, it's, it's very good. So I'm going to guide you in equanimity meditation. Now we'll sit for, you know, probably a good 30, 35 minutes. So take a moment to make sure all your notifications are off, your doors are closed, your family, your dogs and cats know that you're going to meditate, so they shouldn't disturb you. And find a comfortable seat. Even lying down is okay. If you feel you're at the end of a long day and your body is aching, you can take good care and do Shavasana. It's one of the viable postures the Buddha taught for meditation. In any case, find a position where your spine is nice and straight, but not rigid. Just either straight up and down if you're sitting upright or horizontal. Making sure the legs are in a comfortable position, whether you're in a chair, have your feet nice and firm and square against the floor. If you're seated on a cushion or the floor, find a comfortable cross-legged position that you can hold with relative stillness because when the body is still, the mind becomes still. Allow the eyes to close and start to take some deep breaths. Let the out breath release any tension. Begin by taking nine relaxation breaths. With your next few breaths, breathe into any physical tension you may be holding in your body. And then with the out breath, release that tension, feel it melting down into the earth beneath you. Releasing physical tension with the out breath. And then with your next few breaths, breathe into any emotional tension, feeling where you may be holding emotional tension in your body. Breathe into it and then release with the out breath. Feel that tension melting down into the earth beneath you. And then with your last few breaths, breathe into any mental tension, worries, concerns that you may have. Feel where you may hold mental tension in your body. Inhale into it. Exhale, releasing that tension with the out breath. Feel it melting down into the earth beneath you. And now take a moment to generate a heartfelt motivation to practice for the benefit of yourself and all beings. If you wish, you can take the bodhicitta mudra with the two middle fingers straight up and the other fingers folded across each other, like in prayer. 
This symbolizes the single-pointed intention to awaken for the benefit of all beings. And then release your hands, resting the palms down on your thighs. Letting the breath be natural, just an even flow of in and out breath. And now take three people in your life. First, on your left, place a beloved or a good friend, someone you really like. Placing them to your left, either seated, see them see it sitting or standing next to you. A loved one. And then in front of you, place a neutral person, more of someone you ignore or maybe you don't notice very often, the mailman, the checkout person at a store nearby, or somebody you might not know very well. You just see them, but they're kind of neutral. They're in your life, but you don't really feel one way or another towards them. Place them in front of you. And then on your right, place a so-called enemy or a difficult person. Somebody that you have energy around right now or someone you have had challenges with in the past. This could be someone you're holding a grudge against that you don't see anymore, but you have them on your list of those you don't like or don't want to have anything to do with. The person on your left is someone you feel close to and unequivocally like or love. In front of you is the neutral person that you don't really care about one way or the other. And on your right is an enemy or difficult person. And now let's start with the person you dislike. So notice how you feel about them. How do you feel about them physically? How do you feel about them emotionally? How do you feel about how they look, their appearance? How they move? How do you feel about their voice? Their political views? Their energy? 
energy. And think about how your aversion to them developed. Think about what they did to you. How you found them irritating. Get a really felt sense of this energy that you feel towards them. With an enemy, we often carry them with us for years. Even if we haven't talked to them for years, we are still carrying this feeling. Feel how it is to have this relationship with them. And keep that awareness of them and feel like they're really sitting next to you. Like you have that feeling that you wish they weren't sitting so close. And then keeping that feeling. Then feel on your left side, the one you love or like, And now notice how you feel about them, physically. Emotionally. how you feel about how they look, their appearance. How they move. Their voice. their political views, their energy, feel that closeness you have with this person and the desire to have them close. Maybe it is even a longing or craving for that person, or maybe it is just a nice feeling of love and comfort. Really feel how that is. And then think about your relationship with them and how your love or attraction to them developed. Think about how good they have been to you, how they supported you, all the reasons why you feel this way about them.
And now see the person in your life whom you don't have a strong connection with, a so-called neutral person in front of you now. You neither like or dislike them. Maybe you haven't really paid much attention to them. See them in front of you now. And notice how you feel about this person, the so-called neutral person. How do you feel about them physically? Emotionally. How do you feel about the way they look, their appearance? How they move? Their voice? If you know them, their political views. How do you feel about their energy? And really feel this not caring, neutral energy you have towards them, not making any particular effort to get to know them. You're not really liking them nor disliking them. Feel this kind of disconnected neutral feeling. Now, beginning with the person for whom you have aversion, the one you don't like, try to first neutralize that aversion. Don't try to like them per se, but just relax the negativity. Think now about how this person has been perhaps a friend to you in the past, a parent even perhaps to you in a past life, someone who may have been very kind to you at some point. Or even just now recognize their suffering and their confusion and how they have acted this way towards you, which has resulted in this negativity, and how this is created by their confusion, their own suffering. And in that way, develop a feeling of willingness to feel some compassion towards them and release this negativity, the opposition, this feeling, some compassion, and maybe even some care and some love.
And on your left side, feel the person that you are very attracted to or that you care for. And try to release any clinging or attachment, craving aspect, or even a little desire that might be there to be close to them. Just allow them to be in their own dimension, to be free. They still have all their qualities, but you're not trying to magnetize them towards you. You have love and compassion for them, but are releasing the pull of wanting them closer. Now move on to the neutral person and really connect to them. Feel an interest in them. A presence allowing them to be in your awareness and feeling that they have also been as intimate as a parent or a beloved to you at some point, karmic eons. That actually you do have some care about them. Feel a kind of sharpening of awareness, a real feeling of not spacing them out or going vague or neutral with them, but really being present with them. a genuine sense of care in their well-being. Now emanate out to all of them a feeling of equanimity and impartiality Let go of craving, aversion, and this kind of ignorant neutrality in relationship to them. And feel love for all three of them. An open, impartial love that does not have self-interest in it. This sense of friendliness, this metta, coming from your heart, coming from your bodhicitta, your awakened heart-mind. I, I wouldn't hire her. I know. Uh, somebody's not muted, Jeremy. And extend this out to all the people here in this Zoom room together. This feeling of care, friendliness of metta, without attachment or aversion. Everyone in our Zoom room, everyone in the SFDC room, and all the animals, the insects that are in the room and on this surrounding land or home, wherever you are. Feel that impartial presence and love. Gradually extend this out to encompass all beings in your neighborhood, 
your town or city, your state, country, and beyond. And don't forget to include yourself. Feeling this quality of equanimity towards yourself and all beings. And now recall other people who are either enemies or friends or neutral people. As they come to mind, let your mind roam and release them into this experience of impartiality and equanimity, feeling more spaciousness perhaps, a quality of presence, imbued with the quality of relaxation and spaciousness. Allowing this equanimity to become immeasurable, limitless. Particularly when we work with ourselves, we can internally feel it as a quality of patience, of spaciousness, allowing ourselves not to be perfect or labeling ourselves as one thing or the other, good or bad, success or failure, but permeating our internal dialogue with the quality of spaciousness. Observing the, the attachments, the clinging, the constrictions, as well as the aversions, the anger and hatred with more space. Developing a quality of equanimity internally in the internal atmosphere. Less reactive and judgmental towards ourselves, more spacious, allowing. And within that comes humor, a sense of humor, better and broader perspective. Feel that pervade your experience now in some way, some personal way.
dissolving any remnant of visualization back into the space from which it came. Just letting go and resting in silence for a few moments, just with the breath and with this quality of impartiality, of equanimity, spaciousness. free of the extremes of clinging on the one hand and aversion on the other. And then we'll dedicate the merit for the benefit of all. And we will do so by, if you wish, reciting this classic four measurable prayer along with me. Everybody will be on mute, but you can say it out loud wherever you are. I've just pasted it into the chat. Or you can follow along if you can't see the chat. And may all beings have happiness and the causes of happiness. May all beings be free from suffering and the causes of suffering. suffering. May all beings never be separated from the supreme joy that is beyond all sorrow. And may all beings abide in equanimity free from attachment and aversion. May it be so. Thank you. So you may have recognized that each line is associated with each of the four immeasurables. Um, I think we're having some funny mute things happening. Maybe we could figure that out. Um, so the first line is about metta. May they have happiness and the causes of happiness. That's love. May all beings be free from suffering and the causes of suffering. That's compassion. It's wishing to help beings be free of their suffering. Compassion. The third line, may all beings never be separated from the supreme joy that is beyond all sorrow. Of course, you see joy in there. That's empathetic joy, mudita. And the last line, may all beings abide in equanimity, free from attachment and aversion. That's equanimity. That's what we just did. And we talked a lot about attachment on the one hand, aversion on the other. You know, the right side person was about aversion, the left side person was about attachment or, or 
some sort of maybe subtle or not so subtle grasping that we might feel towards those we love. And so that's equanimity. So I'd love to open it up for questions, comments, observations about how that was for you. I'm assuming that that might be um, a different way of meditating on equanimity than what you may have done in the past. Uh, In a sense, it's a little bit of an updated version where you're visualizing placing all three people around you and then equalizing them, and they're all present there. And how did that feel for you? I'm curious. Feel free to raise your hand, um, literally or with your icon. Really speaking from your own experience, you know, what worked, what didn't work, what are you confused about, what was an aha moment, really everything's welcome here. But really speaking from experience, from what we just did. Yes, Jason. I just um, thank you for um, the focus of that, um, because I think that just really uh, med- meditating or, or practicing equanimity is so um, it's super valuable. I found that like what what I really was doing was clinging on the aversion one because I I really I kind of sunk into that and I was um, aware of how the energy of all of these neutral loving and aversion were were so um, charged you know that just that just brought it all to to before and I think it I think it was more clear in this meditation than other practices that we've done so I just found it really um, powerful that way that's great Good. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, it is very palpable, isn't it, when you've got them all three with you in real time and you can feel the aversion on your right and the the attachment on your left and the neutral right in front of you. How was yeah, it for right. you? To I wanted to say that the aversion that. made mm-hmm. me want to... I, I, when you said something in that which was we can, we, that the person that we're averted, that we feel aversion, you know, about can have, we don't necessarily, we may not have seen them, right? We may not have them in our lives at all. Yeah. Whatever was the tension, like I was able to go right back into it. Yeah. And it was like, oh my God, I, I thought, I didn't even recognize that I had that still living, you know, it's like, it's not, I don't have to deal with it every day. It was somebody I worked with that I really had a hard time with. And now I don't have to deal with it anymore. But man, was I able to relive it almost like uh, ruminating? Yeah. Because it was like, I don't, I don't need to have this aversion, but it was so palpable. Yeah. Good. Did you feel some release from it? It kind of came to the fore and then you could make one. Yeah, I just noticed it in a new way. I was pretty, 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 pretty powerfully able to say, you know, I don't need that. That's not, yeah. I shouldn't hold on to that because it doesn't really, it's not, I think it's what also Eve last night was talking about true, you know, real, but not true. It's no mm-hmm. longer true, but it's real. That's right. That's right. So I really, really need to say to my, you know, I need to understand that like, wow, I can make it as true as I want. It's sort of a choice almost. Yeah. I, instead yeah. of choosing to have that live in such a negative space, I can work with the practice of releasing. So yeah, I did feel release, but it was it was after feeling a lot of intense aversion. So. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, that I liked how you started your comment, which was the, the clinging to aversion. You know, we, in a sense, it's, it forms who we are. You know, I'm not that, or I don't like that person, and it's just another way of reifying or protecting ourselves. Yeah, thank you for sharing. I appreciate that. Yeah, and like, why are we still carrying this? It doesn't. It's not doing me any good. 
but we do. You know, it's not always logical. So it's important to have tools so we can really work with it in a, in a loving way. How is it being um, a bit more spacious with yourself? At the end, I chose to highlight that because we don't, in this, this version of the meditation, the self isn't really addressed that much, yourself, working with yourself and equanimity. So I thought it would be helpful to spend some time doing that. Was that helpful? Was that interesting? What came for you there equanimity for yourself aren't we hard on ourselves we either love or hate ourselves don't we (laughs) i'm so great oh i did that so well oh i was such an idiot i'm so embarrassed (laughs) you know it's funny and to have a bit more equanimity with ourselves could be really healing and spacious and liberating and again maybe invite more of a sense of humor you feel something around that anyone want to share? There's no right answers, wrong answers. They're all just equanimity answers. Yes, please. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. <clears throat> I truly couldn't get into that last part that's the truth i couldn't for some reason uh the the rest of it had been very um intense and by that time i just i I was just tired um and when you said about when you talked about at the end about the the sense of humor i couldn't get that part either at all (laughs) for some reason i couldn't but what was interesting for me this time is that I, I felt the, when we switched from the aversion to the loved one, um, I thought this is going to be impossible. I felt the, the, the presence of the aversion so strong that I, I was sure that I wasn't going to be able to switch it at all. It, 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 it did surprised me because I for the first moment I was just like it's I can't do it but then after a little while I completely forgot about that aversion and I was into the -hmm. next thing and I was very connected with the loved one in that and it also surprised me that I could do that and so so that was interesting and then the neutral person it's always hard for me, mm-hmm. especially the part where you you give that instruction about like being closer to that person, trying to have feelings for them. Mm. Mm-hmm. That part, because it's it's really like, who are they? And I'm sorry to say it. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm embarrassed, but it is like that part where you talked about the Ukrainians and your son. Yeah. <laughs> because, I mean, they were very um like they, they were not completely present mm. Mm. yeah I, could, I couldn't like really place them the, the moment you said have feelings for them I did you have a specific person you were able to conjure yes. up good yeah. okay good so keep working with that keep working yeah. with that that's okay. a good in a sense what i'm getting is that's a good uh, sign for you where you can stretch because the other ones are more palpable uh but this could really open up i I think i was like that too i i thought i couldn't really went you know through the years of learning these meditations and trying them and the neutral kind of felt like a oh yeah whatever you know i didn't i didn't have anything to sink sink my teeth into until i realized but that's like all of humanity (laughs) you know and then that then so there was more interest in how can i how can i hook in and the in in Buddhism they often talk about, you know, contemplating that at some point all of every being on this planet has either been your parent or you've been their parent. There's a sense of interconnectedness, even though you can't see it in this life. And I think that is used for these situations where it's hard to feel 
the connection there. So in some way, make that your own and Mm -hmm. really feel that. It'll dawn on you in a way. It'll start to take root in you in an organic way that's authentic to you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank Thank you. you. I'm glad you brought that up. It's good to be vulnerable, you know. We're not always doing things perfectly, and everybody in the class definitely can learn from those questions where we have a hard time. So I appreciate you bringing that up. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, we have Marcella. Hi. Um, Hi. Thank you, Chandra. It was really lovely. Thank you very much. Um, Two things. First, uh, whenever I do these um, types of meditations and they're new to me, and I bring up, um, say, the person I having trouble with or or don't like or whatever um it, it's interesting for me because i i sort of watch this happening in my mind where i it, the person changes like mm-hmm. first it's this person and then it morphs into another person and then there's another person and i have to tell myself okay settle yeah yeah <laughs> take this one <laughs> it doesn't matter <laughs> like it's like i go through this file of choosing or something it's mm-hmm. it's odd mm-hmm. um and then the other thing i just wanted to say is at the end i did really love um the spaciousness and it brought a feeling i was sort of doing a body scan mm-hmm. um for my sense of self and not finding it felt just lovely it just felt really lovely. <laughs> <laughs> I just relief. wanted to share that. Yeah, relief. Yeah. Oh, it's good. Yeah, good, good, good. Yeah, I think that that's really normal. It's just a part of the mind settling too. You know, Marcella, you might find it um, helpful. Maybe, maybe not. But to do some shamatha a little bit longer than what we did before, just so that the dust settles and the mind's a little bit more still, then crystallize who you'd like to work with. I think it's just a process of your mind sort of just doing its natural settling, settling, settling. And it's it's totally normal to have a bouncing, you know, a little bouncy, little bouncy ball mind a little bit here and there. Uh, so again, have more sp- have some spaciousness and, and be patient with yourself around that. And like, kind of like what you did, it's just like, no, Marcella, just focus, stay with one. You can do the other ones. They can line up, you know. I mean, I think it's kind of like that, like, okay, you want to be here, but why don't you take, take a number and I'll deal with you next time. But now I want to deal with this person. We have to sometimes almost have that conversation in our minds. Sometimes I have to say those types of things when I'm having thoughts loop around. I'm trying to quiet the mind or settle in and... I have something looping. I have to consciously say, I see you and I'll deal with you later. (laughs) So, yeah, that's that's quite normal. Yeah, good. Thank you for sharing that. Who else? The quiet people? The ones who never talk <laughs> or don't talk very often or not. It's up to you. Don't want to push, but invite. You don't have to come off the video either. You can just come on as a voice, as the disembodied voice. I see a room full of maybe four or five, six people. Hi, everybody there. How's it going in the in the collective and it's not quite close enough. I can't see your faces, but yeah, you're muted. I can't hear anything. Okay. Can you hear There's a mic right behind you, but you know the mic's quite pretty hot, so don't yell into the mic. Okay. <laughs> okay. How's this? Is, can everybody hear me now? Yeah, it's um, quite it's quite loud, so you don't have to hold it so close. Maybe an inch. Okay, okay, thank you. Uh-huh. Yeah, um, it, the I I agree that uh, the the idea of the neutral is it it's always it always feels like yeah uh, this is really great 
the first part where it's someone that you like or love, et cetera. And then it's the neutral. Well, I want to get to the the part of the person I really hate. You know, it's like, <laughs> why am I bothering in the middle here? And uh, so, but but just like, actually, that's really important is I, I, I this kind of prompted this idea it that is very important what do i think about somebody who i i i have no connection with whatsoever they're say on the other side of the world say they're in ukraine and i i was just sort of thinking like uh in terms of um well, what is like what is neutral or what is neutral for me? And is it like I have if I'm neutral to them, does that mean like I'm right on the line of the, in the middle? Am I right in the where I don't I don't care for them, but I have no am I like right at like zero or or something? And it's hard for me to believe that I'm right, right there in the middle. Yeah. Um, and yet maybe like you talked about the Ukraine situation, maybe like someone would think, well, if I actually am toward the like side of things, then I have to care about them. Mm-hmm. Then I then it's going to like hurt me if something happens to them or the opposite. If I dislike all these people, that's going to be very, that's going to be a a lot of effort. So maybe like it's scary to people to think that they're not just completely dispassionate toward people that they don't know. And when I say that, I, I'm just sort of like mulling it through myself, like, huh, because I, I think maybe I assumed that I was right on that line of one or the other, but that I want to be on this side and I hope I'm not on that side. I don't know. But so that's just sort of um, it piqued my interest to give it some thought. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, in a way, maybe we can say that we're not really 100% zero or neutral towards anyone. I mean, some people have brought that up in these classes before, you know, I'm not I actually don't have neutral people. I mean, even the people, sometimes people will say things like even people they don't know, but they see in their neighborhood, they still have a sense of like, liking them or thinking they're interesting or have an aversion towards them. Maybe they look weird or scary. So it sometimes also it can be hard for people to actually feel that true zero central place of neutrality. And that's okay, too. I think it doesn't have to be perfect. You know, it's not like people have to be exactly neutral. But like you said, it's, uh, you know, just people who maybe you don't care about that much or you don't know or or they're more hypothetical, like people halfway around the world. Um or not, you know, maybe those people in Ukraine or other parts of the world are not neutral to you. Maybe they're people you really do care about and it's easy for you to feel connected. And so we all come to this with different capacities and different experiences. And so that's why this is interesting to see who goes where, you know, who's in what category. And then how do we respond to that? And how does it affect us to do these practices? And the the whole idea, which I'm sure is no secret, is to start to feel more connected to everyone and more well in this case equanimous yes that is a word um towards everyone but not in a disconnected way that was also a subtle nuance that came up in the in the script of this guided meditation which is like when you equalize everyone it's not a dispassionate disconnected feeling it's actually a feeling of connection and equal a quality of care, but also spaciousness. You're not invested in it, um, but you're present. There's a clarity. And that's an interesting place to be. And I really, I can't say I've mastered that, but I definitely have experienced that with some of the 
really special teachers I've been around in my life. I have one funny story of a back in 1998, my first time I went to Tibet, I accompanied one of my teachers. And there were a few of us who uh, were invited to go and, and travel with him into eastern Tibet. He had been recognized as a reincarnation, a tulku of, of the founder of this little monastery in the middle of nowhere in eastern Tibet. We basically had to sneak in there because we didn't have permits. It was really scary. It was beautiful. It was an exciting trip, but also challenging. Our car broke down. We almost got caught. Our, we got lost in the forest. It was a pretty big adventure. <laughs> But he, we called him the Teflon Lama. He was just like nothing phased him. It wasn't like he was dispassionate, but it was almost like he had a little bit more of a sense of humor towards everything, even the food poisoning at the old monastery, you know, or, you know, because we were all fed bad meat. Even the, even the Tibetans got sick, you know, it was just <laughs> at every step of the way where you think they might lose their patience or, or their calm, this, this particular Lama, his name was Hunkar. Hunkar Dorje, which means the white hung, uh, Vajra. It was a very interesting lama. Still teaches in the West, but mostly in, in at home in Tibet. But um, he mastered equanimity. He was, you know, it's oftentimes we can talk about things. It just takes doing a road trip with someone who's got it down <laughs> or um, sitting in teachings or being around serving, you know, being an assistant to a teacher who you can just steep in like wool dyed in the, in the, in the colors of, of equanimity where you, you can taste it and you know what that is. It's not hypothetical anymore. And uh, that was a real gift for me personally. But, you know, Teflon's a little bit not exactly what we're trying to get at here. You know, Teflon's a little cold and maybe too much. And it's not that he was too much. It was just that the analogy was sort of funny because it was like nothing sticks to him. Nothing slides right off like water off a duck's back, duck's feathers. So that's another way of understanding. Tang yom, tang yom. You let go. And then you have equality, you have equanimity. It's also equality. I mean, this this particular of the four immeasurables, this equanimity, has really wonderful implications for social justice, racial justice, where we can really start to see all beings as equal. They don't look like us. They don't come from the same country. They might not be the same gender or religion, but we can we see that underneath all of these appearances, these more superficial appearances that we all share. This is what His Holiness the Dalai Lama talks about all the time, and I'll end with this because I know we're at time, which is that we all wish to be free of suffering and find happiness, and in that we all share that common common humanity, but even animals and insects want that, right? I just uh, gave to the Humane Society who's doing important work on covering, um, you know, surreptitious and illegal animal testing in this country, you know, that's causing immense suffering, you know, so they're not, they're not like, I'm not a monkey, but I can still feel for the monkeys. I wouldn't want to suffer just like I, you know, wouldn't want my children to suffer. So that's when you know your practice is working on you, when you can say like Tibetans, they say, oh, ninja means, oh, compassion. You know, you see someone in harm or in trouble or having a hard time, oh, Nyingje. You know, if you have more of a sense of camaraderie, connection, compassion, that also means that your, your practice is, is working on you. And yet you're also not so emotionally torn and wrapped up in it so that you become incapacitated. You know, that's too much. That's called idiot compassion, right? So we walk that middle path, the middle path, the middle way between extremes of attachment, aversion, nihilism, and eternalism, you know, these kind of classic two extremes within Buddhism. We walk that middle path, and that's equanimity as well. So with that, it's always good to end with the Dalai Lama. <laughs> so... Thank you, everyone. I hope you uh, enjoyed. And I, if maybe Eve, maybe me. We haven't decided who's teaching next week. But hey, it's good to have a surprise. 
and um, and then get ready for a new book study coming out soon, starting in September. Thank you, everybody. Do you want to announce anything, Noam or Pam?